And let's praise God with them. Hallelujah.
the Lord a hand praise. If you know you serve an on, you can testify to yourself about that. If you serve an on time God, come on and give the Lord a hand praise and thank him. Amen, 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 amen. I, I know we're new school, but they used to say, I tried him and I know. Hallelujah. And he's all right with me. Amen, amen, amen. Just take a moment of quiet worship and think about every time in life that the Lord has stepped into a situation, a circumstance. Think about how he has made himself real to you, how he showed himself strong to you. Perhaps you've gone through spiritual turmoil or family strife. Maybe you were in need in an area of your life, and the Lord was faithful to you. Amen. Hallelujah. We have testimonies all over this church. I asked, I asked Tim how he felt when he came up to me on Wednesday night, and he said, I feel like victory. <laughs> you don't go through cancer treatments feeling like victory, but when God is in the midst of it, I wish I had a witness here. So we bless his name and we give him glory and we worship him, not just for what he's done, but more than that for who he is, for all he has been to us, for all that he is, the Lord God Almighty who sits on the throne and we give him glory and we give him honor. Bless the Lord oh my soul and all that This is a worshiping moment. If you're a worshiper, would you just lift your hands and let's just bless him now. Oh, I will bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all, and all that is. We come to worship you, O oh God, boldly and courageously before your throne as you have welcomed us to worship you and to war in spirit, to go forth in praise, to move forward in worship, to open up the heavens, to experience your glory. Somebody help me in this house. Oh, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Come to bless. I come to bless his holy. Oh, I feel a worship moment right here. Can I get about four or five worshipers to stand on your feet and help us tap heaven, help us touch heaven? Say this with me. We exalt thee, we exalt thee.
your feet with us. Stand to your feet with us as we approach the throne of grace. And just worship him in the beauty of holiness. Come on, deacon. As we go before his throne. Come on, you're opening heaven now. You're opening heaven now. Heaven is open to you. The throne is open to you. The Lord is here right now. Forgive me, deacon. Forgive me. The spirit of the Lord says today you have your own altar. I'm going to do something different, deacon. Today you have your own altar. 
And because you have your own altar, you have your own access. Because you have your own altar, you have your own access. So the Spirit says, make your petitions known now. Make your requests known now. Bring to him your tears. Bring to him your trouble. Bring to him your grief. Lift up your prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here. Here. Here is what we will do for the next 90 seconds. You open up your mouth and pray your prayer of petition before God. And I won't have the deacon pray today. Because the Bible doesn't say the prayers of the deacons availeth much. The Bible says the prayers of the righteous availeth much. And in us, there's no righteousness, but in him, we put on his righteousness. We walk in his righteousness. We talk in his righteousness. So whatever your request is, whatever that name is, you open up your mouth right now and just begin to pray. If you want to come to the altar, I'm giving you permission. Keep your mask on. The altar is open to you. If you want to kneel down in his presence, the altar is open to you. Nobody has to stand over you. Nobody has to make you do anything. God's ears are open to you. Perhaps just in a moment of worship, you just want to bow down in his presence. You just want to give your concerns. You have an altar and you have access and he hears you when you pray at home. At home, you can lift up your voice wherever you are and you can touch the heart of God. I see you. I see you. Lord, we want you to show us your glory. We want you to show us your power. We want to see a greater manifestation of your presence among us. We want to recognize your spirit among us. We want you to heal hurts. We want you to heal hearts. We want you to touch grieving souls. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yes, the spirit of God is always in order. The spirit of God is always in order. This is a God moment. Thank you, Jesus. His glory is in this place. 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 And I just want to flow in worship with his glory. a moment of worship. Come on and seal your prayer with worship. Seal your prayer with worship. Let God direct you. Stay as long as you need to. Let God direct you. Let God speak to you, even as we worship, even as we hear from him, even as we hear words of worship. Let the spirit of the Lord minister to you. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because he's so good. <laughs> he's so good. And his mercy.
his place. The Lord is in his holy tabernacle. The Lord is in his habitation. And we are so graced to meet him there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. On Wednesday night, as we celebrated Ash Wednesday service, I prayed that prayer that the Lord would revive us again. And I believe he's doing just that. I believe he's bringing us to a place where we are more spiritually aware and more divinely attuned to the move of God among his people. Think it not strange when you see supernatural and divine occurrences among you, it is merely a reminder of the Lord who is with you. Sometimes church can become so rote and routine that we forget that it is the Holy Spirit who rules and abides and who runs the Lord's worship. And we are grateful to be but vessels of that spirit. If you're looking for a miracle, just look around you. 
for the very fact that we are able to be in the Lord's presence is a miracle in and of itself. I bless you and I greet you and I welcome you to the Second Baptist and I hope we haven't scared y'all. But the Lord has been good to us. The Lord has been, the Lord has been good, good to us. So I'm grateful that you're with us today. I'm grateful that you're watching today. You know, I, I don't want to be superstitious. I don't believe spirituality, true spirituality and superstition having a place with each other. But, you know, the grandma used to say, when God get the blessing, the devil get the messing. <laughs> as soon as we went live, the stream went down and things went wrong. But we're back up and we have people watching us and all is well. But I miss this. And I'm glad to see this. God's people in God's house together. Doesn't it feel good to be in church? Come on, doesn't it feel good to be in church? We used to roll our eyes and I don't know, but after you've been away and separated for so long and had to watch through screens or well, whatever, it's just good to be in God's house together and we're grateful. We're grateful for that. I don't want to prolong your time, but I want to remind you that we're in prayer for the family of Mother Wallace, the Wallace family, the Reed family. Truly our hearts are hurting and God will have to see us through this. Praying for you, Brother Lee. Praying for you, Brother Brian. Praying for all of those who are suffering in this law. Sister Evelyn and Carolyn and their husbands and Brother Charles. And all the nieces and nephews and grandson. We just want to lift up the Reed and Wallace family. And uh, these tough times, this dark road, many of us have walked it. And God has walked with us. Amen. Amen. It's good to see Mama Barbara in the house. Good to see you, Mother Galladay. I'm just going to preemptively call you mother. Because <laughs> you're such a mother to us. And you've been through so much. But you are a picture of strength and grace. And we appreciate you for being who you are. And what you have shown us in the loss of your husband and your son. And we, we are praying for you praying for all those who are going through hard times and struggle and that we know Lord and the Lord is with us come on and go to Ephesians chapter 4 so we can meet at the table Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16 whether you have a tablet a Bible a phone or you just read on the screen with us if you stand with us as I read scripture we always honor the word by standing if you're able if you're able body Last month, let me get out this out the way. The services for Mother Wallace will be on Saturday at 11 a.m. Calling hours at 10. We're asking all leadership to be on board and in place so that we can be of help and assistance and service to this family and our church. And uh, they're getting all things ready. And Mother Wallace had all things ready for herself. She knew what she wanted. So we're going to do as she has requested. Amen. I want to say two things before we uh, get to the scripture. The first is there's a lot in changes happening in our community. A lot of our official uh, organizations and entities are beginning to loosen restrictions in the schools and even our government buildings. And I'm grateful that we are on our way, but not there yet. And we're just doing in deference and honor, especially to our elderly and susceptible members, not because we fear anything or anyone but we just want to be cautious in the movements we make together. And the Bible tells us to prefer and honor each other above one another. So we will have that conversation, and I so appreciate your cooperation and your help and assistance in honoring our request to remain with our masks on as much as possible. If you need to breathe a little bit, it's okay. We just want for one another to share in that. And soon, maybe very soon, we will have a conversation about how to move forward. Amen? But let's be honorable, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Uh, our, our ushers and, and nurses are some of the best in the world, and I want you to love them and respect them in everything that they ask you to do. First of all, their orders come from me, so if you're mad, come fight me, and I got backup. <laughs> but be loving and respectful enough. Amen? 
be loving and respectful enough to simply do as we are asked in our house and don't make any trouble or struggle for them to do what they need to do. I'm, I hear so much about mean ushers, but I done met some mean saints, Amen. mean guests, mean visitors. I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. <laughs> so let's be sweet. I said it this morning, whether you're in a store, a restaurant, or a church, nobody wanted to be in this place. Nobody dreamed this up to put a restriction on you. Those waitresses that have been cursed out, those clerks that have been told off and fought, no, that's unnecessary and ungodly. And so let's, let's, let's come out of that mean spirit. Amen. Sooner or later, we'll see all each other's smiling faces. And you better be screaming and shouting and praising and everything, or I'm going to tell you to put them back on. <laughs> I don't know why you take that mask off just to me mug me now. You can, if you're going to frown, you can put that sucker back on and, and leave me alone. <laughs> Secondly, I was, uh, I was uh, saying last month during uh, Black History Month, I said, you know what, to my buddy Pastor Jeff, I was on a podcast, I said, I want to wear one of them old robes like the old preachers used to wear. And one of our sisters said, I'm, I'm going to get you one. You, I'm going to take care of you. But one of my preacher friends surprised me and gave me one of their old ones. Now, if you don't know this, preachers pass down these things sometimes. Or family gives them off. Now, they got to fit. Y'all know I'm a, little, I'm a little nothing. So he just happened to have a robe for a little nothing. And uh, I'm still going to get that robe, though. But uh, it, was, it, it was a blessing because I feel like you connect with heritage. It's not for show. It's not for flash. It's because when I was slipping in here with grandma, that's what I would see when I looked up front. And, and that's how the word came forth. But how many know it's not about what you wear? Amen. It's what you have on the, on the inside. And especially on first Sundays, you all know I, I wear a robe because I want to be particularly portraying the sacredness of this service. Where we come before the Lord's table and share in holy communion. And I believe that all the different ways of expressing ourselves in worship, there's nothing wrong with doing things a little traditionally sometimes. Amen. Because it anchors us in a faith that is beyond us. And that fits our theme today. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. I was letting the blood get through your body. That's why I'm making you stand. And the Apostle Paul in the 16th verse of Ephesians chapter 4 says these words. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I want to read the NLT real quick. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Our theme today, our subject today is bodybuilders. Bodybuilders. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, somebody say it with me, even though you don't feel like one. Say, I am a bodybuilder. Somebody say, Pastor, I know you lying. I ain't touched a weight, <laughs> an energy drink. I ain't done a pull-up or a sit-up in decades, if ever. But if you're a part of the body of Christ, I've said before, there are just certain automatics that come with relationship with God. There are certain things that come with yielding to the Spirit. It's not just all howdy, howdy, and glory, glory. It's not all just joining somebody's church and attending some service and finding your style, your fit, your place, your favorite preacher, uh, your, you know, the place where you feel God's led you. You, you become adopted integrated into some things. I've talked to you about spiritual warfare, being soldiers. It's not just for those prayer warriors we speak of. It's for every believer who is a part of the body of Christ. You are in a spiritual battle. You, you are automatically a part of God's worship, not the praise team, not the musicians, not those who are especially skilled in singing, but every person who is called by the Lord, who is washed in the blood and filled with the spirit becomes a part of that grand universal gospel choir that speaks the glory and goodness of the Lord. We all become witnesses, not just the evangelism team, not just the outreach ministers. Every single blood-washed believer is an evangelist in their own right. And the only thing stopping you from evangeliz uh, evangelizing is you doing it. And the only thing that needs certified in you is to know that you have been called and saved by the Lord. 
and you have a story to tell and a testimony, and you should by now know the gospel that saved you so that you can share it with somebody else. We're all witnesses. Not only are we, are we all worshipers and all witnesses, and not only are we all in warfare, but we are all workers. We're all called to some form of service, not just auxiliary guild committee special event work, but workers of the kingdom. Workers to show the love, the grace, the compassion of the Lord in a real and, tra and, and transparent and, and solid way so that the world might know through us that God is real. But we are also builders. We are body builders. We are called to help build up the body of Christ. If you want to know what the body of Christ is, it simply is us. The body of Christ is those who belong to Christ, have been called by Christ, redeemed by him, and identified with him. We are the body. Jesus, for a season, for a frame of history, occupied a fleshly body, but that's not the body of Christ. That is the earthly habitat that he enabled himself to be formed in the likeness of man and was sent by God to us to be our Savior and our Redeemer, but he shed that body and left it behind. And, 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 and he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, yet there is still a body in the earth, and it is the church. We are body builders. We, we are called to build up the body. Here, here's a word that was, is our key word of the day. We are called to edify edify. Say it with me, edify. edify. That word edify, E-D-I-F-Y, edify, literally in the Greek means to build up like a house, to build up something structurally strong, something that will stand the test of time, something that will be joined in like a house. One part of the house cannot stand solely unless it is connected to the other parts of the house. I've been a part of a few building projects, <laughs> I've watched my father build a house. We built a church. And you learn a lot watching things built from the ground up that you wouldn't know if you just walked into a finished product. You learn that everything that is built needs support and guidance and boundary while it's being built. So before you pour the concrete that you'll walk on one day, you have to set the footer, the bricks around, the, the cement blocks, and set them in place and create the boundary by which the concrete will be poured lest it just spills everywhere and it's no good to anyone. You lift up a wall, one side of a wall, it can't stand all by itself that way. It has to be supported by support beams until it is properly secured to other walls who are also supported until they are finally joined together. And even then they're not at their full capacity of strength because then they must be covered and secured from the top so that it is all tied together and it cannot waver away. And we've seen the results of poorly built structures. Structures that were in the middle of building, but without proper support, they fell down right in the middle before they couldn't be finished. The church is no different. Each one of us represent a part of the body of Christ. Paul says it clearly. We are all members of one body. And all of us play some significant role in that body. None of us are use useless or worthless. We have a hard time in the church with a Hollywood stage mentality where the only people significant to us are the people preaching and singing and in front. And truth be told, don't mean to point fingers, but I will. You in the pews are just as guilty of it as those of us in the pulpit. Because if we didn't elevate and, and make men and women of the, of the word into gods and treat everybody else like nobody, then maybe the church wouldn't be so imbalanced. Doesn't matter who does the preaching and the teaching. We know that there are different calls in the body, but everybody should be made to feel significant, not just by God, but by God's people. So I said it at the end this morning. I'll say it at the beginning. Don't just give your smiles and your hugs and your good jobs to your pastor. Share them with one another. Lift up each other. Say a good word to each other. Everybody wants to rush the preacher, rush the leader, rush the person that, that performed or shared or presented or ministered. And that's wonderful. We certainly do need your encouragement. It does so much for our heart. But so does that brother who was sitting alone in the corner. Maybe so much more than me because I, I get amens. You know, I, I know how to pull out an amen. I know how to get that attention. It just comes with the territory. But others who might not be in the same spot need that love, if not more than I. 
Because if all you're doing is pointing to one part of the body, one particular member, one particular organ, you are not truly building the body. You're elevating a person. Uh, and we are not called to personal elevation. Matter of fact, personal elevation is what drives us into cultic tendencies. That's where we end up with cults of personality. That, that's where the ministry is no longer centered around Christ, who is the head of the church. It's centered around whoever can get the most attention. Whoever has the smoothest words, whoever can get the biggest crowds, that becomes the focus. And when that person fails, falls, when that person disappoints, perhaps God calls them home. We're left without because our faith was not in Jesus. It was in the person who was called to preach to us Jesus, and I hope they were preaching Jesus. Lest we be left without nothing. We're all members of the body, regardless of title, regardless of education, regardless of function. We're all members, and this body building is an essential function of our faith. And not only is it an essential function of our faith, but it stands in direct opposition to the trends of our culture. We live in an individualistic culture. We live in a self-centered, a me, me, me culture. Matter of fact, we drag it into the church. What am I getting out of church today? Is this, is, this, is this exciting me? Is this making me feel the shakes and the shivers that I want to feel? Instead of what can I give and what can I render? How can I serve? How can I pour out my offering so that the full atmosphere of worship is full and free, not just my own personal satisfaction? That, that, that's, that's the culture of the world that has invaded the church. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a mode, a, a, a part of edification, a part of this building up that involves individual interaction. There is individual edification, individual edifying. When we seek the Lord through prayer and worship and study in our own time and uh, alone by ourselves, but hear me now, my, my dear older brother in the gospel who's always been a friend and mentor of me, Elder Robert Heron, used to always say, no man is an island unto himself. We all need each other. And God designed his church to be interdependent upon each other. There are no lone wolf believers in God's church. No vigilante Rambo believers in God's church where you're just going to go out all by yourself with a little bit of knowledge and prayers you got, and you're just going to defeat hell all by yourself. Your own understanding, your own praise, your own worship, your own study. I got me. If all you got is you, you don't have much. Because whether it's an affirmation or whether even it's an accusation of a wrongdoing, the Bible calls us to be among witnesses. The God, God calls us to be in a place of what the Greek word is koinonia or community that is spiritually vibrant and divinely appointed. Good news for us is we don't have to go look for a body to be a part of because we've been adopted into the body that Christ himself has made. The body is not made because a church got started. The body is not made because a preacher got ordained. The body is not made because a building was rented. The body is not made because somebody printed up a program and gave you an order of service. The body is made because Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Well, you might be asking yourself, what rock? The rock that says he is the son of the living God, that he is the alpha and the omega, that he was sent to die and he rose again on the third day. Upon the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done, that is what makes the church. The church is not chartered by the state. The church is ordained by God. So we are the body. And body building is an essential function of our faith. It is directly tied to the health of our spiritual vibrancy. And many of us are weak because we've avoided not only our participation in, but our obligation to being body builders. I said this morning that my brother was a weightlifter in high school, and I would want to go down with him and, and be with him, but I wasn't committed to it. You could tell he's a bigger man than me, and we both started off the same size, but he stuck with it, and I didn't. And I thought if I could just drink the protein shake, I'd get gain weight, but he said, no, you have to get on the bench. You have to lift the bar, and you can't just do it once, get sore, wake up, and have muscles. You got to do it again and again and again and again, and I learned that if I wasn't willing to go down there and hang with the fellas and, and do the work and do the reps and come back and do it again and take your break and do it again, I wasn't going to be built up, and here I am. So I am what I am because I didn't spend as much time as he did down on that weight bench. 
But spiritually, I still have an opportunity. All hope is not lost. I can still be a bodybuilder. Don't even have to be in shape. But it helps. <laughs> Make a plug there. You can't be that helpful to the church if you're not even healthy enough to be helpful. But it helps. But it's a spiritual thing. I'll get out your way so we can come to the table. It's a spiritual thing to be a bodybuilder. It means you understand the divine call to play your role in the kingdom. And we all have one. Every last one of us has a role and a place to play in this morning what I call the shaping, the sharing, and the sharpening of our faith. That we do it one another. You, you, you know we, we shape each other in faith. Some of us have been misshaped by seeing a misappropriation of faith. But when you have a chance, anybody ever been there, had a brother, a sister, a mama, a daddy, a prayer warrior, a deacon who showed you what it meant to have faith in God? They helped shape who you are today. Bodybuilding means we share faith. And can I tell you as an aside that sharing faith is not all about witnessing to the lost. It's also about encouraging the found. We think sharing faith is just speaking to the person, you know, in the gutter who doesn't know God. But sharing faith might be necessary among the body of Christ. Not that we don't know him, but we might benefit from the testimonies of him that can encourage us in our Christian journey. We share faith when you go up to one, a person who is dealing with the sickness and saying, my brother, my sister, I've been through that. Or someone I know has gone through that. And I can tell you that God is faithful even in the midst of sickness. That, that, that's how you share faith when you hear about job loss and you find out that your brothers or your sisters are going to be unemployed and you tell them that the same God who provided for me will also provide for you. That, that's how you share faith. When the kids are getting grown up on you and you, they about to fight you, they think they all that and you, you don't know what you're going to do. They're getting wayward and some older brother or sister says, I know what it's like to watch your kids do their own thing and, and don't want to hear from mom or dad. Let me tell you that the Lord will take care of them even when they try to stray away. Just keep praying for them, keep fasting, keep lifting them before the Lord and he'll watch over them. He'll protect them. He'll keep them. That's sharing faith. In this community, faith is not only shaped, it's not only shared, but finally it's sharpened. It's honed. It's focused. We become more effective when we know exactly what we are called to do within the body, and we are no longer aimless or wandering in the kingdom, but we are set in what God has ordained us to do so that we do fit together correctly. Everybody can't be a hammer and no nail. Everybody can't be a, a, a bolt with no nut. Everybody can't be a screwdriver with no screw. We all got to play our part to build this house, to be this body. Faith in the body is shaped, shared, and sharpened, but it produces something, the text says. The text says that by this body that has been made by Christ, who has made the whole body to fit together purposely, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of, full of love. Here, here is what edification produces, increase. Edification produces increase. When we build each other up, everybody wins. When we build each other up, everybody walks an incline as opposed to a decline. When we build one another up, God is glorified because even the weak among us are given a more solid footing. That's why edifying should be a prime ministry of every believer, because nobody should be comfortable being in a good place in God while somebody else is struggling, and you don't feel any compassion to not only pray for them, but to reach out to them. I will tell you that there are some sick souls in the church that take pleasure in being more spiritually secure than others, and their testimony is how much better off they are than somebody else. Their testimony is how much more mature they are than somebody else, how much more word they might know than somebody else, how much more experience they have than somebody else, how everybody comes to them, and they're, they're everybody's leaning post. And can I tell you that even if you think that's your testimony, it's a false one, because nobody ought to glory in their own abilities. Nobody ought to glory in their own skills, their own talents, even their own ministry, because if the Lord hadn't given it to you, you wouldn't have it. And the same God who gave it is the same God who could take it away. Dad would say, don't get beside yourself. 
Don't, don't, don't get so wild and high and you get a few accolades and a few testimonies that you prayed for somebody and God worked it out and now they're attributing it to you. You need to learn how to be like John who said, I must decrease so that he might increase. And the more you point at me, the more I'll point at him. You need to learn how to tell folk who want to lift you up. I am not that light, but he is the light of the world. For whenever a man thinks he is something, thinks more highly of himself than he ought to. The Bible says pride goeth before a fall. And I got to apologize to saints that have run, uh, uh, excuse me, members and, and, and friends and guests and even sinners who have run into prideful saints. People who have taken credit for what God has done. Who pretend like the body is theirs to control. Who act like the church is theirs to manipulate. And that they are the gatekeepers of God's righteousness. No, none of us are God's gatekeepers. We are merely builders and workers and servants, worshipers and witnesses. And God has called us all to that work. Before we come to the table, I want to tell you that increase is a direct result of edification. And if you're not seeing increase in your life, you might want to ask yourself, how have you participated in building up the body? Because as the body is strengthened, it will strengthen you because you're a part of it. As the body grows, as it grows in maturity, and as it grows more healthy, and as it becomes more loving and more unified, it will benefit all of us. And we can count on, by God's spirit, seeing increase in our lives. Now, I'm not a health and wealth preacher. I'm not the type of person that's going to promise you riches and millions. But I can tell you there are some things that money can't buy that only God can bring increase to. There are some things that you can't find at the store that only God can bring increase to. Matter of fact, there are some things that even relationships can't give you that only God can give you increase in. And as we build the body one to another, we will find an increase in this body and this house built up, number one, in strength. The Bible says that where I am weak, that's where he makes me strong. And it doesn't just do it because God infuses you with some sort of Marvel movie superpower in your moment of weakness, but because he has planted around you vessels of strength when you're about to fall. Has anybody ever been there? Because I know I have. When I wasn't always at my best. When I wasn't always in the greatest place of confidence and strength. Maybe even doubt was creeping up on me. You'd be surprised at how many preachers go through seasons of doubt. You'd be surprised at how many ministers go through times of pain and, and uncertainty, and you'd also be surprised at where our encouragement comes from. If you think we're always going to a conference or a, or a convention or, or calling up a bishop or an apostle, you'd be surprised at how some of the saints are the very ones that help us to go on. You'd be surprised at how some of the members who are just fresh to the faith, but all they know is the confidence that God can and God will make a way out of no way. And that simple faith, that simplistic faith is enough to make me roll on. I've even heard my children speak a word of life into me and not even know what they're saying because God God knows how to use vessels to speak the divine truth of his word into our lives. And that's where the natural and the supernatural interact in our earthly experience. When God begins to impress upon unwitting and sometimes unwilling vessels to be a ministry to his people in a time of need. And we increase in strength. That word increase means grow. It's the same terminology or context that was found in Christ himself when the Bible says that not long after Mary and Joseph found him in the temple and he had been teaching and being taught of the elders and the scribes there in the synagogue that the Bible says that as they went on, they continued to instruct him in the Lord. They continued to raise him in righteousness and that Jesus grew in wisdom and in strength and in favor with man. Don't you know that because you are heirs with Christ, that you are also destined to grow in strength and grow in favor and grow in wisdom. Don't you know you're not supposed to stay at the same level all your life. You're not supposed to be in the same place all your life. You're not supposed to go through the same trials and the same troubles. Matter of fact, if you've been walking with God for a while, you ought to have some new issues by now. You, you ought to have a new problem by now. You, you shouldn't be going through the same stuff you was going through in 72 when you first got baptized. You ought to have some new levels, some new places, some new new issues that you got to work out that God has taken you up so that you can do more for him. You grow in strength, not just for your own sake, 
but so that the witness of God might be stronger. That our prayers might be more effectual. That miracles might be more normal. That the divine and supernatural work of God would not be some once-in-a-lifetime happenstance, but will become the norm for the believers because they become attuned and ingrained with the heart of God, and they know how to seek him according to his will, and they know how to pray focused on what he has said, and they know how to look for the results of his promises because I've grown stronger in him. Help me, Holy Ghost. Not only will we increase in strength when we're bodybuilders, but we'll increase in stamina. Yeah, it's one thing to be on fire, but there's always the danger of flaming out. And anybody can be hyped for a minute. Anybody can be excited for a few weeks. We see it all the time. I've been there where I got so excited about the word I heard, the prophecy I received, the song that was shared that I just felt like I could run through brick walls. But I found out that a moment can't keep me. Just one sermon ain't enough. I've got to discipline and dedicate myself to the Lord. And I've got to allow him to strengthen me, not only by what he gives me divinely by his spirit, but why he, what he allows others to minister unto me, not just to increase my strength, but to help me grow in stamina. Because this race is not for those who run faster than others. This walk is not just for those who have the most excitement on a Sunday morning. This, this ain't just for the people who know how to scream and shout and cut a rug during revival. But it's for people who can endure the dry seasons and the valleys of life. That's, that's when the Lord says he's with us. That's when your prayers have to be effectual. That's when your determination has to be strong. When nobody seems to have a word for you. When none of the prayers seem to be working for you. When people seem to be against you. That's when you have to have stamina to outlast the devil in his tracks. That's when you have to have stamina so that demons will tremble when you keep on calling the name of Jesus even when it seems like it's not working at first. You need stamina to deal with mean folk at work and, and folk in your community tearing you down. You need stamina to keep a good marriage strong and to love each other in spite of your faults. You need stamina to stay active in the church when the other members get on your nerves and offend you. You just can't be flaming out every now and then and running out of gas because the Lord has need of you. That's why you got to get a refuel. I wish somebody would talk to me that when church is over and the lights are out, you need to find a prayer closet. You need to find a personal worship. You need to find a witness of your own so that the preacher don't have to tell you about the Lord, but you can talk to him for yourself and say, I know that I know that that I know uh, that God is real uh, and I don't need a Hammond to be behind the preacher and I don't need a microphone to be spoken into. All I need is a still small voice uh, to keep me running on uh, until the Lord calls me home. Uh, tell somebody I'm increasing not only in strength but in stamina. Not only do we increase in strength, not only do we increase in strap stamina, but finally, we increase in stability. Uh, this is what the Bible says. We are strengthened, Paul says, so that every little thing won't come knock us over and knock us out. Now, who's been in an every little thing season of life? Who's been there where you were at the last moment, at the end of your rope, the straw that broke the camel's back? That last piece of weight on you. Anybody know what it's like to be so shaky and uncertain in your faith that any offense, any misfortune, anybody who treats you wrong, any bad preaching or teaching could take you right out of your faith. But you cannot stay that way like a baby who wakes up at night and everything bothers them and makes them cry. Sooner or later, you got to grow up. You got to mature. And I come to find out that when you get grown, Sister Melanie, ain't nothing more sexy than stability. I wish somebody would preach to me. Hey, ain't, no, ain't nothing more sexy. Watch this. Some of them folk that you didn't want in high school and you see them later with a good job and taking care of business and living in a house, you wish you had dated that nerd. 
I know because I'm one of them. You wish, y'all ain't talking, you wish you would have stuck with that boring person. You wish you would have stuck with that Puritan girl because you found out that while it was good to be popular and it was good to be the hot girl and it was good to be the jock, what really matters in the long run is stability. Can you earn a job and keep a job? Can you make money and save money? Can you make a child and raise a child? It don't matter what you can get. What matters is what you can keep. I know a whole lot of folk that can get a woman, but they can't keep a wife. I know folk that can get money, but can't save a dollar. I know folk that can get a job, but can't stay employed. They don't have stability. And the church don't need any more folk that scream and shout on Sunday and don't know who God is on Monday. We don't need no more folk who can pray heaven down when they're in the midst of the saints. And as soon as they get out in the world, they crumble at the first cuss word. We need folk that have stability. People that know the word and are rooted and anchored in it. I'm not rooted and anchored in style. I'm not rooted and anchored in tradition. I'm not rooted and anchored in denomination. I'm not rooted in my favorite preacher. I'm not even rooted in Second Baptist Church. I'm rooted in the word of God. And because I'm rooted in the word, then I know when I'm hearing the word. And I know when I'm not hearing the word. Because I'm rooted in his word. That's why I can stand strong when life is falling apart. And still mount the sacred desk and say God is yet worthy of all the praise and all the glory because I have stability in him. I am not shaken by false doctrine and I'm not moved by bad theology. I know my redeemer lives and I know the truth of Jesus Christ because I'm rooted in his word. I am just as hungry as Bible for Bible study as I am thirsty for worship because my real satisfaction comes from the word of God. And you can't sing me happier than the word can make me. You can't shout me happier than the word can make me. Because when all else fails, the word will keep me solid. The word will keep me standing. The winds will blow and the storms will rise and the rain will fall. The grass will wither and the flower will fade. But the word of the Lord it stands forever and one day in the history of mankind there may no longer be a second Baptist church but there will be a word of God one day down the line there will no longer be a Todd Johnson but there will be the word of God one day down the line your favorite preacher will go to sleep but the word will keep on living and I'm glad today that when the storms come, I don't have to look to the left or the right. I don't have to search for an answer because the answer has already found me. I don't have to search for a solution because the solution has already found me. I don't have to go looking for help because the help is already with me. I don't have to go searching for hope because hope is already with me. And because I have this hope, I can stand tall. I can stand strong. I can stand firm and say, for God, I live. And for God, I die. I can be like Job and say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Can you say that today out of your spiritual stability? Everything's not going right, but blessed be the name of the Lord. I've got some failure in my life, but blessed be the name of the Lord. I've got sickness in my body, but blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't have enough money, but blessed be the name of the Lord. I have this truth in me that the same God who called me here is the same God who will lead me through. I have confidence in him because he died on a Friday but on Sunday he got up 
with all power, power to give me strength, power to give me stamina, power to give me stability. So here I stand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest strain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock on Christ, the lily of the valley on Christ, the bright and morning star on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground, all of the ground, all of the ground is sinking sand. Can you say yes if you're standing on it? Can you say yes? If you believe him, can you say yes? If you trust him, can you say yes? If you love him, ain't he all right? Ain't he worthy? Ain't he good? Ain't he merciful? Won't he do it? Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Stand with me. Stand with me. I stood. I stood this strong. I stayed this long because I've been built up by the body. The body of Christ builds me, encourages me. But it is not I, but Christ who lives in me and who gave himself for me. So be a bodybuilder as I stand on the word and you stand on the word. When I see you slipping, I know how to snatch you back to the word. Somebody say amen. And when I see you faltering, I know how to lift you back on, get you back on the solid rock. You'll turn to the left. We all do. But ain't it good to have somebody to say, no, no, son. No, no, brother. Come back around. Trust God again. Believe him again. Let him lead you. Let him guide you. This season is a season of return for some. Back into worship in this corporate personal place. And we've been shaken. We've lost so much. We've lost so many. Nothing seems the same. But I can tell you who never changes. Can I inform you that there is one who never changes? He is Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So don't stand on church. Don't stand on tradition. Don't even stand on the preacher. Your strength, your stamina, your stability must be on Christ. And if we're all on the same foundation, then we can be a house built up, fitly joined together so that the Lord might, he might make increase among us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity we give now to turn our attention from our problems and our struggles and give them to you. Lord, we pray that by your divine spirit that you would move supernaturally, not just because we sang and we worshiped and we bowed, but because we belong to you. We are your vessels. We are your instruments of glory. And we need more of you in us to be better believers, better witnesses, better workers, better builders for you. Those watching online, those who are seeking salvation, those who are looking for relief from the sins they have committed, those who need a new lease on life, we pray that you call them by your spirit and draw them to your side. And we will be grateful to you. We'll give your name the praise We'll glorify you before your, for your goodness and your mercy. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. While you're standing, we're going to come to the table, and I want you to maintain the spirit of sacredness and the spirit of seriousness. Thank you. But if there's one today that has not received Jesus as their Savior, this is the time where we don't move. Unless work is calling, you don't move. This is the moment where a decision is made, where the Spirit calls, where God is saying, come unto me. Come and believe. Come and be saved. Come experience that new life in Christ. You've done it your way. You've walked your path. Now come and trust Jesus. If that's you today and you want to give your life to Christ, you want to start over again, you want a new start, come on down the aisle. If you're a little nervous, ask somebody, would you go with me? We've all been there. If that's the call on your life and you know the Lord is calling you, maybe you've stepped away and started doing your own thing. You, you're not unsaved, but you're not in God's will where you ought to be. And you need to rededicate your life to Christ. You don't fall in and out every other day, every time you make a mistake. But sometimes we can go so long without repenting that we need to restore our relationship with him and start anew. If that's you, come on. Rededicate and reestablish yourself in Christ. Don't leave here the same way you came. Maybe you are a believer, you are a Christian, but you've had weak moments. And a part of that weakness has been not being a part of the body. You don't have a church home. You're a believer, but you don't have a church home. And you've been searching, you've been looking, you've been going and checking out, and I know how that goes. Truth be told, I don't know how it goes. I've always been in one church or another. But I've seen people come and have to wonder, is this where God would have me to be? Can I tell you, let the Spirit minister to you. And if you feel that call, come and say, I want to be a part of the body. If you're watching online and you want to be saved or you want to be a part of the church, come on and down the aisle so we can recognize you, receive you. And embrace you as a part of the family. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you're responding online, we're responding back to you. We've had several come online just in the last few weeks. God is good, and he will meet you where you are. Amen? If that's you, why don't you come? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we have made invitation, and you steady make invitation. For hearts to know you. We pray that every soul that received the word would allow it to take root in their heart, to minister to them far beyond this moment, that the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher, might make great revelation in their hearts, in their minds, in their spirits, that they would never be the same again. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're standing, we'll receive our communion and dismiss. So take a moment as our deaconess comes. And if you don't have your elements in your hand, you can slip your hand up, and our ushers will get it to you. This is our most sacred portion of worship, and I'd ask that you mind it in that manner. You boys can go sit down. I like training them. I will cling to the old rugged. It never gets old. It never gets old. And exchange. Shit someday. Come on and sing. So I'll I will cling, I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it, and exchange it someday. Father, we thank you for this table, these humble symbols of bread and cup that represent the body broken the blood shed and poured out for our sins. Nothing was spilled or wasted, for it was all for our salvation and redemption. 
And as we remind ourselves in this sacred moment of the horrific suffering, the humiliating experience of the Lord Jesus upon the cross, we are reminded that it is our place he took. It is our salvation he purchased. It's our redemption he won. That we are therefore justified by faith because we believe in he who you have sent, Jesus, the son of the living God who died on Calvary's cross and rose again on the third day. Help us to ever commit and dedicate ourselves to the gospel cause that we might not just partake of his body and blood, but we would be witnesses to it. And for this, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a moment of private prayer of consecration. This is a good time to ask the Lord to forgive you, to cleanse you, to consecrate you. Maybe even in your heart, you need to forgive somebody. You might even need to forgive them in this church. And I'd much rather see you go to them and say, sister, brother, I'm sorry, than harbor something in your heart while you partake of a sacred element. But we do know that as we pray for repentance and forgiveness, he grants it to us. And we don't have to feel guilty or ashamed because it is the blood of Jesus that washes us clean. So take a moment as I prepare myself of silent prayer and we'll take together. Amen. Paul received by the Holy Spirit that on the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Let's eat together. Thank you, Jesus. After the same manner, he took the cup. And after he had supped, he said, this, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Take and drink ye all of it. Let's drink together. Thank you, Jesus. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Somebody say, thank God for Jesus. Come on, try it again. Say, thank God for Jesus. Come on, somebody say, thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a hand. Praise. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know. Hold on to your cups. We have trash in the back. We have the trash in the back. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. Come on, church, ring it out now. Open up. I know, I know, I know it. I know, I know it. I know it was the blood. One day when I, one day when he died, he died, he died. I know, I know it was the blood for me. I know it was the blood. I know it. And I know, I know it. I know, I know it was the blood. One day, one day, he died, he died. I know it was the blood. Now, come on, put those hands together one time, one time, one time. I know, I know, I know it was. One day when I, one day when I, he died upon, I know, I know it was the blood. One more time, everybody, I know, I know it was, I know, I know it, I know, I know it. 
One day, one day when I was lost, he died. I know. Amen, amen, amen. Let's be faithful to the Lord in our giving. Worship and giving is worship itself. Amen. We give in a different way now. We give on the way out of our church. For those who are in the house, if you'd like to give online, you could give at secondbaptistwarren.com or at PayPal, and it's on the screen at home at sbc1510main at aol.com. But however you give, be faithful. Amen. And give unto the goodness in the Lord and unto the obedience of the Lord to us. We give in our tithe and we give in our offering. And how many know God will bless you as you are obedient to him? I just need a few witnesses. Now, if you can't be a witness yet, you can start by being faithful, by being a tither, by being a generous giver. And watch God do more with your 90 than you could ever do with 100. Amen. I always say his windows are bigger than your wallets. <laughs> His windows are much bigger than your wallets. So let's give unto him by faith and unto obedience to him. However you give and whenever you give, let's give unto him. And we'll do that in our power to be as faithful and frugal as we need to be. Here's an official announcement because we do a two-week notice at our church. We will have church meeting two Thursdays from now. So that would be the 17th of March. And no, you can't go out for St. Patrick's Day. All of our Irish members, you got to come to church meeting. Amen. We all got a little something in us these days, so especially old Flanagan over here. He's a <laughs> but church meeting is March 17th. Somebody say March 17th. Please send out reminders to your friends, your family, your circles, those that you are affiliated with in the church, so that everyone knows we always do a two-week notice. And uh, I am grateful that God has been good to us for another year. We're grateful to report our progress and how God has blessed us and prospered us in spite of a pandemic season. He's been good to us. So let's come out and be a part of that because there's not a lot of churches out there that will tell you everything. We tell you more than you want to know. Amen. Y'all be like, okay, that's enough. No, we're going we gonna to count this line too because we want you to know where every penny in our church goes and how God has used us to be a blessing to our world. So March 17th, I believe we'll go to 6.30 p.m., will be our church meeting, all right? So all leaders will be here, all members be here, and we look forward to seeing you. See you on Wednesday in Bible study, and pray the Lord's blessing. Any other announcements? We're good? All right. Anything else? We'll stand up for Mother Wallace's funeral on, on Saturday, and uh, keep all of our other bereaved families in prayer. Amen? Let's receive this benediction. May the Lord God bless and keep you. May he smile upon you. May he give you strength. May we increase in strength, in stamina, in stability, as we all serve as bodybuilders in the kingdom. We bless you and we thank you, O oh God, and we leave in your peace, your protection, and your provision. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're a guest or a visitor, hang out and come see me. I want to say hi to you. If you're a guest or a visitor, come see me. The ushers will direct you from the back, row by row. Hang out. The ushers will direct you from the back. God bless you.